Hello, I'm Bob LaLiberté, Principal Analyst of the Cube Research, and welcome to our Boston studio for a special Cube Conversation, which is part of our exclusive Cube coverage of AWS's annual conference, reInvent. Now, one of the things we're exploring is how to drive real efficiency in cloud environments. And this is really important given the increased use of cloud and multi-cloud environments. So our guest, John Purcell, Chief Product Officer Do It will help us understand this illusion of efficiency challenge that so many organizations face in their cloud environments and how to overcome that by leveraging both technology and human expertise. And so welcome, John. Thanks, Bob, great to be here. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. I think we're going to have a great conversation. So let's get started, I think, by just looking at this challenge that we talked about, this illusion of, of, of efficiency. And what are you seeing today in the cloud and what is this illusion of, of efficiency? Yeah, I think so. So do its primary purpose in business is to work with companies to ensure that they are um, effectively harnessing the cloud in the best way possible, as completely as possibly to support and drive their business and the growth in that business. Uh, and so that breaks down into a variety of different practices, as you can imagine. Um, but I think to your question, uh, a lot of sort of cloud operators will, will explore that environment to determine are we operating optimally? Are we operating how we would de define efficiently? And we come across every day this, con which is why we coined the term, the illusion of efficiency. If you rely on classic traditional observability systems, observability uh, platforms, they will tell you at a, at a, a sort of a core, um, you know, on a core metrics basis, am I using the technology I've deployed as effectively or as efficiently as I might be? What they won't tell you is, is, is that, is that infrastructure, are those workloads performing the way we had intended them to operate, right? So by understanding the intent of the workload as you're deploying it, then you can use the data that's being fed out of, out of systems to really determine whether you are actually operating efficiently or if it's just an illusion as we would call it. Got it, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And it seems like for the most part, organizations are operating continuously under that, under that illusion. They're just leveraging and maybe blindly trusting the tools that they have them to tell them how efficiently they're running. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the sort of the traditional questions we ask ourselves are, are we ready to scale? Do we have the right infrastructure type deployed? Is our choice of technology um, supporting our, our scale, supporting our sort of the, the, ultimately at the end of the day, supporting the experience we're trying to deliver to our customers, right? Uh, and so that's what we're really trying to help them harness. Absolutely, that sounds great. And I know from, our prior conversations that you like to talk about the six pillars um, of the cloud. Maybe you could also explain what those are and why it's important to address all of them. Sure, um, you know, these are sort of six areas that I think over really since the cloud sort of really came into its own and started to become um, a very relevant place to run workloads, to run your business. These are sort of the areas of concern that companies have realized we need to be paying attention to and doing work to improve. So whether it's you know, operational excellence, the way we uh, deploy workloads, develop and deploy workloads to the cloud, whether it's the security posture, once we're there, the reliability, are we actually, are we running? Are we up, what's our uptime, for example? You know, whether it's um, the efficiency of that operation, as we talked about earlier, am I, is my traffic passing the way I expect it to? Are we truly set up to, to operate um, efficiently? Um, whether it's cost optimization, very, very popular uh, and important topic these days, and ultimately then sustainability, which is of, of course of growing concern for many, many companies. So, you know, the cloud operators, the hyperscalers themselves have sort of gotten their arms around these as areas of concern, whether we call it the well-architected framework, but in general, more generally, I would say these are the, the traditional areas that when we work with our customers, they're coming to us with questions, we're engaging with our technology across all six of those uh, areas of concern. Got it, and what do you typically find when an organization omits one of those areas? If they're looking at four out of six, three out of six, how, I guess that would be a good question. How many, how many times do you find organizations are actually looking at all six, or is there any common starting ground where they'll start and focus on one or yeah. two areas? When, when, when we engage with our customers, um, they're typically maybe more dialed in in one area than the other because that's where they perceive an area of need or that's where they perceive they need assistance. So by deploying our technology, we can sort of focus on, on all six, right? Um, 
but when we're sort of fusing together this idea of machine and human intelligence to really hunt for that true underlying efficiency, get past that sort of the illusory effect of that of, of, of efficiency. Um, what we find is that companies tend to be, let's say, more aware of gaps or vulnerabilities in one area versus another. But there's generally, we find, work to do in all six, quite frankly. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So one of the things that I find fascinating in, in talking to you and, and learning about what you're doing is that there's so much emphasis on technology these days, and especially AI, right? It, it, everything, you can't you can't turn on the news without hearing about AI these days. However, what I found really fascinating is that you believe, and in it believes, it's a combination of both that technology and human experience. And so I think that's something I find really fascinating. I've always thought as part of those feedback loops, it's really important to get the wisdom of the experienced people, right, the resources today, because in 20 years, everyone will be relying on AI and not understand the, the intricacies and the details that, right. that maybe go into a lot of these, these uh, technologies. So I'm wondering if you could shed a little bit more light on how do it infuses the technology and that human intelligence and expertise um, to add value to your offering. Yeah, so we, we, we are technologists at heart. We are a technology company and have been for over a decade. And so we've built up you know, really sort of thousands of years of cumulative experience in the world of cloud operations. What do company, how do you, how do you build a company or build a business by deploying in the public cloud, whichever, whichever cloud is relevant to, to you. And so we've built up this deep contextual knowledge um, of how to do that well and, and where to look if something maybe goes wrong. And so our, our technology, you know, um, you know, sort of as a, as a platform, um, is a very efficient way to sort of gather data, to look for the things you know to look for. Maybe even um, when we're talking about large data sets, for example, you know, billing data that's running through a cloud environment, operational or metrics data that, that are flowing out of a cloud environment. Technology quite often is, is the, really the only effective way to hunt for and identify patterns that might be telling you something or, or indicating something to you. So of course, our story starts with deploying technology in the right way and then leveraging it to kind of surface insights we believe are relevant. But, you know, we have over 30,000 customer interactions per year, right, with the human component of our solution. Uh, and quite often they start with the same core question, right, which is, uh, what were you trying to achieve when you deployed this workload? What is its purpose in this whole cloud environment in your business at the end of the day? And when you take the story the data appears to be telling you or the technology is telling you, and you layer in that contextual knowledge of what the intention was in deploying this, that's where you really find the insight. And you can really laser focus on, okay, so what's the, what, you know, what, what kind of remediation you know, steps do we need to take here or do we need to equip you to take um, you know, as the customer? So the, this is how we feel. I mean, generative AI for sure, Bob, is going to help us with that technology component, yes. and of course, we're leveraging it, you know, um, uh, you know, effectively to do so. We still feel like the technology can take you to a point, and whether we're feeding the output to you and letting you decide, or you just need to phone a friend and do it as the company that we, you know, yeah. we want you to think of. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point because I mean, even in a lot of the best. AI environments today, they're trying to get to about 80% efficacy. I was at a show last year and someone had talked about how they, how they went on, it was a year long project, they, they created this uh, model and so forth and they were at 3% efficacy, mm -hmm. <laughs> which clearly states they've got a lot, of, a, lot more, uh, yeah. a lot more runway to go there. They were encouraged by the fact they at least got started and were building in, but when you see some of the more sophisticated ones, the very mature ones at 80%, and they're trying to push up into 90, and you're seeing things like the agentic AI and and you know RAG and things like that, trying to increase that efficacy and make them make them a little bit smarter. It still, as you said, it points to the need for some human relevance there, and also that that human experience to be able to help drive and improve the technology. So I'm curious with all the experience that you and your company has, how has that impacted the technology that you're delivering? I know mm -hmm. you've, you, you mentioned generative AI, and yeah, Ava, I think, is one of the solutions. Correct, so yeah. Forth. So I'm curious as to what that, that internal feedback loop looks like at Do It for how you improve 
the effectiveness of the technology that you're helping to deploy to your customers. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Ava is is the the name we 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 ascribe to our um, generative AI based technology. Um, and look, these are inference models at the end of the day, right? And so we believe the advantage we have in, a, in, in our ability to leverage this and, and increasing that efficacy score you, that you mentioned is simply because when we work with a customer, we are gathering and processing so much information about the environment that you've deployed, um, which is essentially what you've asked us to do. And then the model can, can look for connections Right, it can it can it can form inferences based on a thing happened. What could that thing have implied? What not may happen? So there's a predictive component to what the technology can tell you. We still do, and so we're, we're obviously we have an ongoing research investment into how you know to try, how how are sort of how is the evolution of Gen AI, if I could put it that way, um, best harnessed in a way to really deliver on this core mission that Do It is 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 sort of pursuing here, and so what we're finding to this day is there is still a point at which the next step is guesswork, right? The next step is, in, and whether that's intelligent inference or that's truly a guess, it is still, an, you know, it's implied, right? So our customers um, consistently rely on being able to talk through, you know, geez, we, we deployed this tech, it looks like it's well architected, it looks like it's performing well, the resources look like they're adequately consumed, and yet it's still not scaling effectively. What were you trying to achieve? What, is, what does success look like here for you? And to us, we have, not, we have not been able to make that connection directly. We have not seen the market be able to make that connection directly purely on the basis of technology. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. There's, obviously, there's still work to do, and, and uh, fortunately, humans need to do that work, although we are seeing more of the agentic AI taking hold to help with that. But again, I, I look at those as efficiency pieces, right? How do we make that, because there is so much data that has to be gathered, there is so much that needs to be interpreted. So having the, having the machines do more of the rote collecting, correlating, et cetera, mm -hmm. and letting the, a lot of the interpretation still. I, I think, Bob, that is at the core of, of why we think um, our approach to customer engagement is innovative. At the end of the day, we, we're, we're leveraging technology, whether that's sort of tr what we would call traditional tech, or whether it's generative AI um, enhanced technology, <clears throat> and we're, we're leveraging that to do a lot of the work uh, that we feel just tech should handle for you. It should just be behind the scenes, it should be doing the work and then surfacing to you things that you, you tell it are relevant. Right. Right? So that if and when a, a human to human interaction is required, that A, we're starting from a much further progressed stage. We, we don't have to do all of the, the manual menial sort of troubleshooting tasks. We can get right to the heart of the issue and really get you to efficiency on a, on a much shorter time scale. So speaking of that, can you share any customer examples of where you were able to go in and have an impact and deliver better outcomes for your, for your customers? Yeah, we, 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 you know, we've, been, we've been working with our customers now. Um, you know, we have over 4,000 customers in our, in our base. We're fortunate enough to, to call our customers. We've been building this business now for over for, for over 12 years. And so these are the customers that contribute to those, that 30,000 interaction number I described to you, um, you know, each year. And so we're the, this is exactly the model of the engagement we have with all of them, right, or with most of them. Uh, one of our favorite examples that we use to kind of illustrate this, this blend, this blended innovative service delivery sort of concept, it's, it's a simplistic example, but I think it illustrates it quite nicely. So. Um, if, if the audience is familiar at all with the idea of caching as a technical sort of construct, right, where instead of um, you know, retrieving an object in, 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 in cold storage right, or, or, or warm storage, we can actually just look it up in memory. It's a quicker, cheaper way to, re you know, to retrieve something that's commonly retrieved. So we worked with a, with a financial services company that had deployed in an environment, had deployed infrastructure essentially that had caching as one of its core components. And they came to us and said, we just, we're just there's something going wrong here. It's, to, it's not scaling effectively, our costs are going out of control and we can't figure out why. So one of the core things we discovered when we worked with them, again by understanding what was your intention here, right? You had deployed a caching cluster. The, by all of the traditional observability metrics, that, clus that cluster was being, quote, well utilized, right? Mm -hmm. It just looked like it was doing what you asked it to. But when we really got under the hood there, what we noticed was 
the cash hit rate was quite low. So although your cash was full, so to speak, meaning your resources were fully utilized, you were still hitting the database 70, 80% of the time when you went to retrieve an object. So now you're paying for a cash cluster at full capacity and you're still paying for that database lookup. So this the concept of a double whammy, right? Yeah. So we were able to work with them to sort of unwind or fine tune a little bit some of the business logic associated with what's cached, what isn't. Now we didn't necessarily do that work for them. It's really just understanding, here's what we can identify for you to, to restore that path to efficiency. And the te again, the technology identifies, generates the metrics to tell you one part of the story. Humans are understanding the second part and that's what that path to efficiency for that particular customer looked like. Very that, effective. That's awesome, that sounds great. Fortunately, that's all the time we have, so I want to thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Bob. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all for watching this special CUBE conversation from our Boston studio. Again, part of our exclusive CUBE coverage of AWS's annual conference, reInvent. And for more information on Do It and its innovative approach to cloud efficiency, please make sure you check them out at their booth on the show floor.